Ar šo informāciju kabatā mēs dodamies pie mūsu pirmā šī rīta lielā vieslektora runātāju uzstāšanās. Tas ir Nils Maklīns no Eskils UK Lielbritānijā, izglītības nodaļas vadītājs. Vienā no savām intervijām Nils ir teicis, ka mūsdienu skolā izzūdu nākotnē vēl vairāk izzudīs tas, ko sauc par tādu kā bijību, tikai tāpēc, ka kāds ir vecāks vai tikai tāpēc, ka kāds ieņem noteiktu amatu. Tas jau ir tas, ko jūs tikko rādījāt. Mēs nebaidāmies mācīties no bērniem, nebaidāmies mācīties paši no savas pieredzes, bet kā tad īsti to salikt kopā mūsdienu izaicinājumus un skolas struktūru, to, ko vajag un to, ko gribas. Tad ir šodienas uzrunas tēma – saistītā pedagoģija, izglītības tehnoloģijas un nākotnes skola. Maklīra kungs, vārds jums! Atcerieties, ka latviešu valodas tulkojums ir pieejams kanālā numur 1, un jūs varat mums sūtīt jautājumus uzstāšanās gaitā. Thank you. Good morning. I used to be a teacher. You're going to have to do a little bit better than that, I think. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. My name's Neil McLean. Until very recently, I, I now, now work for myself, I headed up the uh, education part of eSkills UK, which was the UK organization about developing the technology skills needed by employers. Before that, um, I've been involved in technology all my life. I used to be a teacher. I first used a computer in the classroom in 1978. He doesn't look that old, you're supposed to be thinking, when I say that. Um, in 1994, I uh, wrote the UK's national curriculum for IT. And since then, I've been heavily involved in the use of technology in schools. Um, the slide up there I'll perhaps come back to is one I, I, I'm on a group that advises UK ministers on the use of technology in the classroom. It's the Education Technology Action Group, and that's a summary of some of the things that came out of that group. That, and we've heard, actually, some of these already. Learning a lot more global, technology not in your hand but up in the cloud, personable, wearable. We'll know more about how we learn. We'll be better at measuring the performance of young people. Um, we'll have new models of teaching and learning, and online learning is an entitlement. You either believe that or you don't. But that was a kind of marker that we put down. Um, but before we start, um, let's ask a question about why do we actually educate young people? Now, there's lots of ways of answering that question, lots of ways of answering that question. Um, I'm going to pick on two. Um, one came from a guy called Matthew Arnold, who was a 19th century inspector of schools. He was a poet in the UK, and he talked about the role of education to pass from one generation to the next the best that has been thought, said, and done. Education is stewardship. Looking to the past and passing on the best of that past to future generations. One answer to the question why we educate. There's another answer to that question, um, which is forward-looking. We educate young people to prepare them for an increasingly uncertain future. Um, first observation of the day. For most of human history, for most of human history, those two roles were identical. If you were a native Plains American Indian in the 14th century, being told stories of your grandparents' hunting was perfect preparation for next Thursday. Some of the challenges we face are around these questions about whether passing on the best that's been thought, said, and done in the past is the preparation for the future. And interestingly, certainly in the UK, we have a polarized debate. We have people who say, stick with 
Shakespeare, stick with the past, stick with whatever. That's the stuff that's lasted. And we have the radicals who say, no, we need to throw all that away and prepare people for the future. Um, what I'm going to be saying is both those positions are wrong. And that technology actually can help you bridge the gap between those two. Um, I want to talk about some of the educational challenges we face. Um, continuous change, scale. Education's big. There's a million primary schools in China. If you look across the world, education is absolutely huge. Um, I've got new paths. In the past, um, people went from little school to big school to an apprenticeship or a university to a job to retirement. People don't tend to do that anymore in the developing world. The paths they follow are more um, circuitous than that, in and out. Um, childhood's changing. And one of the things that's changing childhood is technology. If you ask my children how many friends they've got, they'll say 2,470. Whether they mean the same thing as I do by friend, um, I don't know. Uh, this point's been made already. That's, uh, that's, an old, that's, that's my youngest ch child. Actually, that's my eldest child. I ought to know that, oughtn't I? That's my eldest child. That's Jonathan McLean. Um, it's an old picture of him. Um, he was born in the year 2000. I, for, for, those of, for those of you interested, I'll explain why I use an old picture. It's because my stuff ends up on the internet. Yeah? And that sort of concerns about that. He was born in the year 2000. My grandmother, his great-grandmother, died a few years ago at the age of 101. That means that my son, Jonathan, might have been born in the last year of the 20th century, live all the way through the 21st century, and die in the 22nd century. If he inherits a bit of my grandmother's genetic material, and if we sort out the problem that means that men die before women, soon, please, um, he could be there in the 22nd century. The teacher that is teaching him now is touching the 22nd century. That's an astonishing thought. Um, you just think in terms of wh what I talk about is that people's lives now bookend history. People used to only live within history. But if you think of my grandmother being born in 1903 and dying in, I can't remember, well, 2004, just think of this country. Her life has bookended a huge amount of history. You know what I mean by bookends? The things that go on the Times books. Yeah? She's not just lived within history, she's straddled it. And what's special about digital technology? Um, while I'm being a little bit philosophical about this, because I do think digital technology is special. And I'm going to suggest two things that I think make this technology special. The first one, which is both good and bad, is technology breaks the traditional link between craft and product. If you go to the Sistine Chapel, you can look at the ceiling and you can see the craft, the work, the effort that went into producing that. You hear a piece of music that's produced now and you've no idea. You've no idea whether it was days, weeks, months or 20 minutes on a laptop in a bedroom. The link, you can't look at the product and work out and infer the craft. It's a big challenge of the technological age. It's particularly a challenge for examiners, by the way, who are used to looking at product and inferring things about it. The second thing that makes technology special is it extends our reach. Um, from the time the first person picked up a stone and threw it, the first, bit of first bits of technology that extended human reach all technology extends our reach. Um, now, 
beyond Titan, one of the moons of Saturn. That's how far we reach now. In a more prosaic way, it means my children can be in their bedroom and in Japan at the same time. Yeah? It extends their reach. Um, and third thing that's special about this technology, there are two things which I think make us human. Um, they're not the only two things that make us human. There's a lot of others. But there are two things that I think make us human. One is language that makes us human. What's fantastic about language is I am not a prisoner of my own history. I can learn from you, I can learn from you, I can learn from you because we can communicate, we can share. We're doing it today. The other thing that is unique, actually, about human beings is technology. That means we can change our geography. If it's wet, we can make ourselves dry. Yeah? And what this technology does is bring together those two things. It is a language technology, this information technology. And that makes it particularly powerful for learning. Because an awful lot of learning is about language, isn't it? Yeah? Okay. Steve Jobs put it better than me. Steve Jobs was the Apple guy. He said, uh, technology is the amplifier of our intellect. Amplifier. Make bigger. Sometimes I describe the technology that young people have as if they were walking around with 30 meter long arms. It extends their reach, but they knock a lot of things over when they do it. Yeah? It's a powerful amplifier of what we do. And if we can do things well, we can do them better. If we do things badly, it'll amplify that and we'll do it worse. Yeah? If you write bad music, the technology helps you produce a lot of it. Yeah? If you do bad poetry, the technology helps you produce a lot of it. It doesn't make it good or bad. It amplifies what, what you can and can't do. If that's the big philosophical picture of, 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 of I think, the impact of technology on culture, um, let's have a look at some specifics about how technology is changing little bits of the economic um, world. That's, that's an EU quote, by the way. I, mean, I can't remember the figures. I can only remember the UK figures. Um, in the UK, we need 140,000 technologists a year. Just to put that. In the UK, there's 600,000 people in a year group. That means every year, we need at least a quarter of them coming into technology. That's a challenge. Um, it's true for most developed nations as well, the size of that challenge, in particular in particular areas. I thought I'd give some illustrations of that. Um, so I thought I'd choose sport, being a bit male, um, and I'd choose fashion, being a bit fe female. So forgive the stereotypes. Oh, well, let's go back, because I've got these. Uh, um, some of you remember that, ge that uh, Germany won the World Cup. Perhaps you'd not aware that the, about the big data that they used to do it. Let's go back and have a quick let's go back and have a quick look at that. You see that sensor there? The players have things in the back of their jacket, a, a, in the ball, on the boots, and in a training session it generates millions of data points. And then, yeah, 7 million data points in a 10-minute training session. Uh, that's a real actual thing from a training session, Chelsea training session. You see the guy with his iPad there giving feed, feedback in real time to the player. Here's an example from fashion. Um, one of the things they say in fashion is that everything that ends up in a sale is a mistake that someone made buying it in the first place. Yeah? 53 billion data points fashion industry analyzes now. The software allows them to look at 53 billion data points on purchasing a fashion around colors, around things like that, to make those decisions. Tesco, the UK supermarket, has 360 million personal profiles on people depending on their shopping. 
for good or bad, this is huge. If I go back to the football one, I think what's going to be really interesting as football becomes more data-driven, every team in the top of the Bundesliga in Germany has a team of data scientists working for it. Now, so we're going to see the difference between the cultures that adapt to the use of technology in sport and the cultures that stick with flair and, you know, passion and whatever. It's going to be quite interesting to see how this develops over the next few years. And uh, it matters to young people. That, that's a friend of mine's daughter's self-portrait. She's 15. She did it in school for her art um, projects. I quite like that. That's quite an interesting thing. Um, I've done workshops where I've just put up that with teachers and said, let's think about what that actually uh, means. I'll tell you what I said to her. I said, um, so all these cables here, is that all the information that's coming into your head then? Is this you overwhelmed by information coming into your head? Um, she looked at me as if I was a real old person and said, no, that's the information going out of my head. Yeah? This is not her under threat from the outside world because of technology. This is her connecting with the outside world and speaking to it through technology. As I say, she's 15. That's part of her art coursework for a qualification that, that she's doing. Um, as I say, with some teachers, I have just put that up. And, what do we think about that? You know, is that a good self-image? Is it a bad self-image? What do we think about it? I wouldn't have drawn myself like that. Um, let's think about these young people then. Um, this is very UK, um, but it is quite interesting. When, uh, when education in 1800 and whatever first became statutory in the UK, it was fixed. You can, I don't know if you can see the second one down. Learning year based on the agrarian year. The reason we have long summer holidays in schools in the UK is so that young people can bring the harvest in. Agriculture accounts for less than 1% of the economy in the UK, but we still have a school year that allows people to go and bring the harvest in. It's amazing. When the class size was fixed, it was fixed at 30 to 40 because that was the size of a platoon in the Victorian army. There was no idea how to do this. We now treat these things as if they were the law of God that it should be like that. You know, the school year should be like this. The school class should be like this. They were arbitrary decisions of a particular time. Um, this is you. Some of you, anyway, are a screen generation. You're comfortable with this technology. Um, you're comfortable at learning with others rather than just learning by yourself. You're comfortable about you learn in different places, not just one place, an institution called a school. Um, this is the young people. I call them the wraparound technology generation. Technology is all pervasive um, for them. Um, they learn where and when they want to learn. And for the first time, um, not counting what encyclopedia salesmen tried to do in the past. Learning is open through completely different channels. Um, I, I, I put a slide up about my elder son. I, I ought to talk about my younger one when he was three years old. Um, we have an office at home. I came home. My wife said, we're going to have to do something about Alex. I said, what? Well, he's been in the office. Okay, right. Now I'm thinking he's broken the printer. He's stuffed a Teletubby toy in it or something like that. He's done whatever. No. Nope. He'd gone on, turned the computer on, logged on to his brother's account, gone online and was playing a Ben 10 game, bashing away at the space bar. He was three. This stuff has always existed as far as he's concerned. He's never known a world without it. His attitude to it is his wraparound. It is like clothes. It is just the stuff that's in the environment. 
and both my children learn here. You know the idea of a black market, a market that isn't part of the proper market. So here's the proper market, schools, formal learning. This is where my 14-year-old learns. He wants to know how to do something in maths, how to multiply brackets together. He goes to YouTube. He does not ask his teacher. Yeah? Occasionally he asks his teacher because he likes his teacher. But he goes to other places. Sometimes to me, but more often than not, by himself to these other places. If he wants to find out something about how glaciation affected Cumbria, because he's doing it in geography, he goes to other places. The word we use in the UK is contestable, that there's no longer only one way of doing things. There's another way of doing things um, for these young people. Um, the thing there that says bridge of dissonance is because, of course, there is a tension between those two things because they happen at different paces, don't they? And they're determined by different things. This is determined by a syllabus and is scheduled. This is just in time when ready. Yeah? This is based on some model of learning and sequence. This is whatever I need now to do what I want to do. Yeah? Distance in approach. Actually, I'm not arguing against for or against one. I think they both exist. Um, and I think they're both incredibly important, and there are great opportunities around them. Um, but only if our learners have the capability to use this technology effectively. Um, and some of the things that I'm going to talk about, we talked about already, actually quite a lot of things I'm, I'm, I'm talking about have been said already, um, which I happen to think is good news. Um, it's about capable young people. There's... A professor of science, Professor David Layton, in the UK, and he came up with five types of capability that he said young people need in the digital age. Well, actually, he was talking about technology in general, not just the digital age, any technology, to live with that technology. Um, the, first, the first area of skill competence he talked about was... Awareness, to recognize the products of technology around you. You know that's a PowerPoint slide. Yeah? Because you know it's a PowerPoint slide and you know a little bit about how PowerPoint works, you know that it's easier for me to do bullets than it is to do some other things. Yeah? You're aware of, how the, of the technology. You see it when it's there. You recognize it. Actually, some of it's quite well hidden, particularly in music nowadays. But you recognize the technology. You're aware that, that technology's um, there. The second kind of competency he talked about is user um, competency, user skill. The skill to use the technology to do what you want to do with it to use technology products, to use software, to use office applications, to use the internet, to search, to do those sorts of things, a user capability. There's a, um, a Native American insult that says, he could use one, but he couldn't make one, which brings me on to the next competence, which is the ability not just to use other people's technology products, but to create your own. There's actually some great examples of that round there. Yeah? One of the things that's happening across the world is an interest in coding for young people. The idea that people actually need to be making technology products themselves, not just using the technology products of others. This shouldn't surprise us because they should be making art themselves, not just looking at the art that others have produced. They should be making music themselves, not just looking at the music that other people have done. They should be making dance themselves, not just looking at the dance that other people have done. They should be writing themselves, not just looking at... So they should be making technology products themselves, yeah? 
Um, the uh, fourth competence he talked about, um, which he called the evaluator competence, has already been talked about. Um, this is a great website. It's in English, so I'll read some of it out. Um, I've used this one with young people about this sort of number. Um, it's, a, it's a website on Christopher Columbus. It says, Christopher Columbus was born in 1951 in Sydney, Australia. His home was on the sea and Christopher longed to become... It's nonsense. Yeah? It's deliberate nonsense. It's this point, can you trust what you find on the internet? And there's some great examples of things that people have put up for you to use with young people around this. There's one, um, there's a nice website on Victorian robots. And you can see, you see these robots walking across Waterloo Bridge with all these people with the long dresses on, and whatever. Another favorite of mine, and I, I'm not sure how this will translate well, there's a great website on um, dihydrooxide. Um, I don't know if that came across, dihydrooxide. And the whole site talks about the number of people who die each year by ingesting, getting dihydrooxide in their lungs. Um, the huge number of fatalities, there's hundreds of thousands across the world, people who die from, you know what dihydrooxide is, it's water, H2O. But they call it dihydrooxide, and, and, and they quote the actual figures, the number of people who drown, the number of whatever, and the whatever. And the whole idea is to get young people used to the idea that you need to critically evaluate whatever you see on the internet. Yeah, It's a really powerful thing. And, uh, and I've seen some fantastic lessons on this, by the way, not just using the Christopher Columbus thing, but it is well worth doing almost deliberately <laughs> getting them to look at some nonsense. Because um, otherwise, what most young people do is they cut and paste from the things that come in the top three that they find on Google. Yeah? If they don't do these sorts of things. Um, the last competence, now this is hard to explain, that he talked about, but it's been behind some of the things I've been saying earlier on, is <coughs> what he calls a holistic competence. What he means by that is understanding that the technology you use shapes the way you think about the world. In the same way as the 19th century Prussian state was shaped on a mechanical view of the world, the mechanical clock was the highest technology of the day. The technology of the day shapes the way you think about the world. Um, I'll give you one example um, this is my nephew. He's a bit older now, but I used to have arguments with my nephew uh, about music. And that's because all the music he seemed to like went... <laughs> 160 beats per minute, relentless. And I'd play him some music I'd like, and he'd say, it's sloppy. It's out of time. It's not precise. It's because it had a human being playing the drums. Yeah? The way he listened to music was affected by the technology of the day that had shaped the music. If you've got the technology to get instruments in tune, which actually is very recent in human history, then you hear when it's out of tune. Yeah? If you don't have that technology, you don't hear it. It's not available to you. Yeah? The technology that you use shapes the way we think about things in quite deep ways. Um, we're all people who've grown up with a kind of mechanical view of the world because that was the prevailing model of things. That was the prevailing technology. So we tend to think of things in cause and effect, mechanical ways. If you grow up in a different technology, you think differently about the world. And understanding that is Leighton's fifth competence. Is this making sense? Yeah? Making sense of five different sorts of things that young people will need to get out of all of this technological education. Awareness, 
to recognize the technology that's around them, user, the ability to use the tools, maker, the ability to make their own things, digital makers, people who can construct things, build things, create things, evaluator, people who've got critical thinking skills who can look at what the technology is doing and be critical of it and understand where it is helpful and where it's not helpful, and the deep one to recognize that whatever technology you use shapes the way you think, sometimes in ways you don't notice. Five competences that he talked about. Um, let's think about this capable young person. And let me be provocative just for a minute. Um, what people tend to worry about with, when technology enters the classroom, when technology enters something as important as education, is that it might be dehumanizing, that we might lose the human aspect of all of this. My pushback, my argument is look at what's happening now and ask yourselves how human, and I'll take UK examples because that's what I know, how human is it to march 150 people into a hall, to sit them in rows, to give them a pen, to give them 90 minutes and to tell them to write about osmosis because that's what's on the exam paper. Yeah? We sometimes romanticize where we are currently. Yeah? We sometimes romanticize where we are currently. What that slide's saying is actually what the technology should be allowing us to do is not turn learners into robots, but recognize that a lot of what we do, how we assess, how we examine, already treats them as if they were robots. And let's use the technology to think about things in a different sort of way. Different kind of assessment. Um, I've talked about my two sons. I'll talk about my father. Um, he died recently. My father played the trumpet. He first started playing the trumpet professionally at the age of 14. Okay? So he worked in music all his life. He uh, conducted for Frank Sinatra. Yeah? So he waved a stick for Frank Sinatra. And... Oh, He conducted for Frank Sinatra. He uh, worked with Sir Neville Mariner in the uh, Academy of St. Martin's in the field. And he wrote music for the BBC. Put your hand up if you think you really need to know what his exam qualifications are. Of course you don't. You only need exam qualifications to stand proxy for things. It's not the thing, it's the thing that you have instead of the thing, yeah? When my father became a music teacher, um, he had to do an audition. It's the first time he'd done an audition since he was 14, and he was about 54 when he went into music teaching, when he was too old to, tr to travel kind of thing. So they got him to do an audition. He'd not done an audition since a child. Um, he came in, they said, what are you going to play for? Us. He said, well, I brought some stuff, have a look through it, and tell me what you'd like to hear. And that surprised them, for a start. And he said, while you're doing that, I'll warm up the trumpet. And while he warmed up the trumpet, he blew a few chromatic scales, and they said, it's okay, you're in. He could demonstrate his capability without the need for any certificate, any whatever, any whatever. How much of what we do in qualifications is purely because we haven't got the means for people to demonstrate the thing itself, so we use something else to stand for it. This is a huge, huge issue in the UK. Um, so what's this mean for pedagogy? What are the sorts of things, if we want these capable um, young people who can take their place in a digital world, What's this actually mean for what happens in the classroom? And uh, this report, you don't need to read it because I picked out the bit, looked at 
I think it was about 140, 148 pieces of research on technology and education to look at what are the things that seem to work and what are the things and have impact. And they came up with a very simple list. I'll go through them. Learning from experts works. Communicating directly with someone who knows something about it. The scientist who Skyped into the classroom works. The musician who Skyped into the classroom works. The email exchange about your project works. Learning from experts. Learning from others, your peer group works. Using technology to kick work backwards and forwards and work collaboratively works. Learning through making. Um, I'm going to keep on coming back to that one, but I talked about the importance of digital making, not just consuming. Um, works. Learning through exploring. Not just looking at one explanation, looking at a set of explanations. Not just writing, I don't know, history essay on the causes of the French Revolution, where they'll just plagiarize and download and cut and paste. Tell them, find 10 essays on the causes of the French Revolution and tell me which one you think is best and why. That's not a cut and paste exercise now. That's a critical thinking exercise. The fact that there's loads that you can download up there is actually a good thing. Yeah? Um, exploring. Enquiry. Structured research works. Practicing. It's a bit boring, but practicing your tables, practicing your grammar, practicing whatever. Actually, there's evidence that it does work, you know, if you want people to do it. Um, Learning from assessment, I've talked enough about assessment. And learning in and across settings. One of the big things that you as teachers know, um, I'll give you a concrete example. When I was training to teach, I trained maths and science, physics. Okay? I had the same group of 14-year-olds for maths and for physics. And without going into the detail, I was doing something which, which was a, a simple equation and they had to move things from one side of the equation to the other. And they told me, we haven't done this. I said, I've just done that with you in maths. And they said, yeah, but that was maths. We haven't done it in physics. They weren't transferring learning between settings. Yeah? Using the technology to take your learning with you between um, settings. I talked about um, the positive kind of things. Um, I'm going to say one of the things that bothers me about the way people think about technology in education. Um, that's a British post box, yeah? For some people, the idea of technology in education was getting stuff into the head of the young person, you know? Getting content to them getting content into their heads. Um, that isn't learning. No one learns like that. Um, learning looks like that. Learning is something that grows inside the mind of the learner. No one can put it into you. Yeah? No one can put it into you. No one can sell learning. It's not a commodity. You can't do it. Learning is created inside the mind of the learner. And the exciting thing this technology offers is the opportunity for learning by making. Because using the technology, you can make all sorts of things. Um, if you want to know a bit about music, make some. If you want to know a bit about, I don't know, I, something I that end up in lots of primary schools in England, Mondrian, the painter. Have I got making some? Yeah? If you want to understand a solar system, Make one. Maybe not a real one, but there are places you can go to online, you can build your own solar system. You want to understand what a mammal is? Make one. There are places you can go and you can create your own mammal. You can put it in different environments and you then find out why, if you're at the South Pole, you have to be big. There's no insects at the South Pole. Be big because of the heat um, retention. Learning by making, by producing things. And for those of you who are into the idea of constructivist pedagogy, the idea is by constructing something here on the screen that's in the public domain, other people can see what you're constructing, 
you construct something here. Does that make sense? You build something using the computer, and that helps you build the understanding here. It's how people learn for most of human history, by making things, tinkering, playing with things. The technology allows you to do that with things that would be unimaginable in the past. Um, let's think about this digital school. In this age where it's, we can't make the promises to the young person that were made to me. The promise that was made to me when I was at school was work hard, study, go to a good university, get a degree, and you will have a job that will see you through to a pension. That was the promise that was made to me a long, long time ago. That was it. We can't make that promise anymore. There isn't a company on the planet that knows that it will be around to pay a pension anyway. You know, you can't think like that. So in that age, this is from a friend of mine, Professor Diana Lorillard, what are the sorts of things that, uh, what are the sorts of things this, that this digital school might be offering to the young person? First one, why should I learn? We've always wanted to answer that question for young people. They ask it. Because you have to isn't really a great answer. There are things online where you can do, as I say, mostly in English, because an awful lot of it's American at the moment, personalized needs identification. What sort of a learner are you? you know, what sort of things interest you? This is why you need to learn. Linked to careers advice and things like that. What can I learn? Um, Schools used to see themselves as the sole provider, as if they were a supermarket, and you could only have the things that are on the shelves in the school. Schools are now more like Amazon than a supermarket. It's not what we've got on our shelves. It's not what I've got in my head as a teacher. It's anything out there I can offer to you through the technology. Um, sorts of things we're seeing in the UK is the growth of people learning foreign languages that we haven't got teachers to teach. Because you can learn it through online. Yeah? Um, Japanese, one that's quite popular in the UK. Schools offering Japanese through online sorts of things. Um, how could I study? Again, in the past, people went to one school. If you stick with the Amazon model, it's not just what they have on their shelves. They have a whole set of partnerships as well. So the school, rather than being the sole provider, is the point of contact between me as a learner and the teacher. And the teacher can draw on all sorts of other organizations. So I'll give you an example of this, um, of... Uh, one of the things that's happening in the UK is maths tuition provided online by real people based 15,000 miles away from the school in the Indian subcontinent. Yeah? And people are, people are doing catch-up lessons from other parts of the world. Yeah? The school no longer the sole provider. It's saying, we can use this learning service. How will I learn? At my own speed, without wanting to go into all the details of this. Yeah? Not at the speed that everybody else to do, not at the speed of the teacher teaching to the middle of the class and the rest of us either getting bored or struggling, but at my speed. How do we know I've learned? Regular feedback. Um, there are a small number of bits of education research that are absolutely you can't knock over. One of them was done by um, professors Paul Black and Dillian Williams. And they said the most, they, what they found out was the most powerful um, thing that a teacher can do to help learning is to give feedback immediately after the event. Not telling them they've got a D six months later. Immediately after the event. Um, that kind of feedback. Now, that's hard. One teacher, 30 children, 
giving immediate feedback is really, really hard. So for most young people, the feedback comes, they've moved on. They're being told to turn left at the next set of traffic lights and they're already four roads on. Or not. Yeah? So, formative assessment, feedback. Um, this is one of the big areas that's, that people are developing IT products around now to give feedback to young people on their learning. Yeah. There's some quite exciting stuff happening in artificial intelligence, would you believe, around all of this, where, where um, the computer asks questions of the young person, helps them think about it, and then helps them prepare for a conversation with the teacher. And lastly, the whole area of careers advice and future advice and connecting to the world in the future. Okay? So th the technology now can answer all those questions. And if you were to come over to the UK, I could sh show you a school where each one of those was happening. What I couldn't do is show you a school where all those are happening. <laughs> yeah? I couldn't do that because it's early days for everywhere. Um, there are schools when, where some of this thing's happening. Um, so how do we help schools move on? I'm going to move out slightly. This was a bit of work um, I did with the, in a European Union project called the ITEC project. And it's based on... I've got five minutes? Oh, well, okay. It's based on the idea of a maturity model. Um, some things change continuously. Some things change by going through steps. A butterfly is not just a big caterpillar. It's changed. Does that make sense? Yeah, as you go through, it actually changes. And what maturity models, the idea behind it, was saying, let's look at how a classroom or a school or any organization changes, and I'll, I'll give you the concrete one, in, in the, the, the one that came out of the iTech project in a minute. Um, lots of people have been doing work on this, looking at different industries and how it changes when it moves from one level of technology use to another level of technology use. Because it isn't just we have more technology. There's a qualitative difference in the way the technologies actually um, use. These are, these are what just ones I've stolen, so they're from business, um, all sorts of areas have actually used them. Um, this is the model that the iTech um, project came up with. And it talks about five stages in the development of the classroom. Um, five stages of maturity. In the first stage, and you'll be able to work out, the idea is you use this, and those of you coming to the workshop tomorrow, this is what we're going to be doing, to work out where your school is at so you can plan for the next step. Yeah? That's the idea. You know, are we an egg? Are we a larva? Are we a caterpillar? Are we a butterfly? Where are we? And what's the bit that's going to come next? So the very first um, stage in this model um, is... The exchange stage, um, and it says localized use. And if I talk a little bit about those two things, what does exchange mean? You use an interactive whiteboard as if it was a chalkboard. Yeah? You use email as if it was letters. You just exchanged one thing for another thing. And it's localized use. It's odd people like me when I was a science teacher, doing it in my own classroom. It's not coordinated, it's individuals just saying, instead of this, I could do this. Yeah? I could use this instead of this. Next step is when you've got more than one teacher using it, so it isn't one heroic teacher um, using technology. You've got lots, and they can start to coordinate their use of technology across the school. Okay? Um, the Enriched Dale. I'll, I'll work through all of them and then unpick them in detail. At the next stage, once you've got all the teachers doing something, 
using the technology, you can start to think differently about how you do things. Um, I've called it process redesign. Um, I'll give you a concrete example. One of the things that a lot of schools in the UK do is they send letters home to parents. Actually, they don't send letters home to parents. They send letters into the bag of the child that very rarely gets to the parent. Yeah? But the idea is we communicate through these sorts of things. Now, just word processing the letter home is just exchanging, isn't it? You've not really changed anything. Saying, how can we redesign the way we communicate with parents? Up to the age of 11, parents count for 60% of the variability of a child's performance at school. 60% of how well a child does at school is down to the parents. If you want to do well at school and you're a nine-year-old, choose your parents well. You know? That's, so involving parents is a powerful thing. And, and for the past few years, this has been a really strong thing. And, and, and so what we're seeing now is rather than the letter home, anytime, anywhere, continuous communication with parents. Yeah? Completely redesigning it. Text messages to parents' phones. Text messages saying your child doesn't come in, but also a text message saying your child did really brilliantly in assembly this morning, or your child's geography project was fantastic. As I, when I talked about this when we were launching this in the UK, I said, if, if I can check my bank account any time of the day or night, why do I have to wait to Christmas to find out if my child's learning to read or not? You know, why? It's insane. You know? So this idea of completely redesigning the way you communicate with parents, that's one of the things. Timetabling is another one. We move kids from place to place to place to place to place. I was an advisor to a very, very rough school near where I um, live. And I can remember, this is back a few years ago, the head teacher doing a speech to the teachers saying, this year we retake the corridors. Um, discipline was so low in the corridors that they wanted to retake them. And it got me thinking, you've got this problem because the kids are moving around all the time. Why are the kids moving around? Why do the kids actually need to move? Well, yeah, they need to move to go to the gymnasium. Yeah, they need to move to go to the science, whatever. So different timetabling models, process, redesign. Step three on the model. Step four, once you get to that point, of redesigning the school processes. You're now using technology to communicate with parents. You're now using um, technology to timetable in a different sort of way. Dynamic timetabling, responsive timetabling, for example. Not a timetable that's fixed in September and is the same in May. Yeah? It becomes important. When I was here, if the technology failed, I just told my students to get their textbooks out. It wasn't a disaster. When a school gets to this point, it's a disaster. Because all the key processes depend on it now. So you need a completely more professional way of looking after the school network, dealing with the technology, managing it. Yeah? because it's now doing what the Americans call mission-critical things, things that really matter if they don't um, work. And the very last kind of um, step on all of this is when you've now got, you're beyond individuals using it, You've started to think about some of the big processes that are happening in the school, the big things we do, assessment, communicating with parents, timetabling, curriculum management, resource management. You've redesigned those processes. You've made sure your technology is looked after properly so it actually works. And then you can do interesting things. You can say, hold on. Not you, but other people can say, we used to think we can be, we were a supermarket. Perhaps we can be a bank as well. We used to think we were a primary school. Perhaps we can be this as well. 
perhaps, I'll give you a concrete example of this. Um, a guy that I used to work with, um, he was a head teacher of a primary school. That was four-year-olds to 11-year-olds. He got the school accredited as a vocational training centre. Everybody said, why are you doing a vocational training centre with four to 11-year-olds? He said, because my children have parents. He extended the school using a grant that was about tr IT training for employment to get more equipment and completely redefined what the school was. And for some people, the school day was 9 till 4, and for others, it was 12 till 7. And in the evening, parents were coming in. And uh, a lot of the IT tra technicians in Cumbria were trained through his, uh, his school. That's innovation. Okay, so what we did, and I'm going to go very quickly through these, so don't read these because these are on only matter if you're uh, coming tomorrow and these slides will all be available, is as part of a, a toolkit that you can find through EU Schoolnet, we took that model and we unpacked it to work out what the key features are for each stage. I'm going to go very, very quickly through these. Um, so that teachers or a school board or a district can look what's happening, work out where they are and say, we're at that stage what do we need to do to get to that stage? Yeah? Let's not just aim for the sky. Let's know where the sky is, but let's not try and leap there. You know, let's move from this stage to this stage. Or from that stage to that stage, depending on where the teachers and where the schools are. Now, we've had quite a lot of success across Europe in this. Thousands of schools across Europe have tried this kind of thing. And then, what we get them to do, and this is for those coming to the workshop tomorrow, is start thinking, what are the teaching and learning activities that would differentiate, that make the difference between this stage and this stage? Okay? I think my time's up. So the last thing for me to do is say thank you for listening, because I've talked for an awful long time. Um, but then, as my mother always said when... Uh, God was giving out the ears. I was getting an extra helping of mouth. Um, so not necessarily a challenge for me. I think there's opportunity for questions later on. As I say, for those coming to the workshop, we'll have a go using this model to work on teaching and learning activities. You can find all of this up there. I am neil.mclean0 at gmail.com until I set my consultancy ad address working properly. If any of you ever want to get in touch, do, you know. It'd just be interesting to keep the conversation going. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you. We are about this. Um, you, should keep, you should keep your microphone and take the earphones because there, we have time for a few questions. Okay. Um, nu, liels paldies, esam dūši klausījušies, un paldies tiem, kur izmanto iespēju un atsūtīja jautājumus. Un uh, mēs nepagūstam atbildēt uz visiem jautājumiem, bet uh, tā tendence iezīmēs ļoti skaidri, un kā jums šķiet, kāda ir tendence. Nu, labi, labi, tas viss izklausās labi, bet kas tad ar skolotāju lomu? Mēs taču esam atbildīgi. Un ko tad, lai mēs tagad darām? Un patiesībā tie jautājumi, kas paspēja atnākt līdz mums, bija par to, un ko tad tajā melnajā tirgu? Kā tad mums tur būtu? Kā ir skolotāja loma melnajā izglītības tirgū? Un, ja jau tas digitālais laikmets ir tik visaptverošs, tad, tad nu, kur tad tur īsti ir tas skolotājs? Patiesībā, klausoties Nīlā, man nāca atmiņā kāda diskusija par to, vai vērtību izglītību un tādas svarīgas dzīvē, svarīgas lietas var iemācīties arī virtuālajā vidē, nu, piemēram, pacietību vai, vai burkānu ravēšanu tikai īstajās burkānu dobēs vai pietiek arī apkopi to dārziņu savā virtuālajā pasaulē. Nu, tad kā tad ir ar to mūsu atbildību un mūsu vāru un skolotāju lomu. Ok. Um, people learn from human beings. You know? Directly or indirectly. That's, that's how um, they learn. Um, they learn from human beings 
modeling the thing that's being taught. Um, there's a primary teacher I work with, and her, her children's reading got better when they saw her reading. She was modeling the thing that she wanted to happen. Yeah? That's something that only another human being can do. Um, and it's, that's the higher order learning. If you want to know a set of dates and you need to learn them, go online and learn them. Yeah? If you want to know a mathematical technique, multiplying brackets, go online and learn it. If you want to know how to be a mathematician and solve mathematical problems, that isn't just multiplying brackets. You know? You'll learn that by being part of a you know, dialogue with a person. I believe that very, 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 very strongly. Now, the positive thing, I think, um, and we've already seen this. I don't know if any of you um, learned a musical instrument. I've talked about music a lot. Um, but if you learned the piano, there's an awful lot of repetition and practice in learning the piano. It is insane for a highly qualified, skilled person to be sat next to you while you do that. What they need to do is concentrate on the higher order things like your musicianship. That's why they try, what they try and do, which is why they get so cross when kids don't practice. So what we're seeing increasingly um, in some of the schools that are at the front edge of this, they're looking hard at their curriculum and they're saying, where do we actually allocate our time as teachers? Do we allocate our time to the empowering stuff, the visionary stuff, the learning to learn stuff, the excitement of the subject, the modeling a mathematician, me not instructing you in how to multiply brackets, but me modeling how you go about solving a mathematical problem? Yeah? And then separating the two out. And if you go, I mean, one of the schools, Shirelands Academy in, Lund in Birmingham, it's actually done that quite an awful lot of what the kids learn that is the repetitive, ordinary stuff, they do online. Okay? So what they'll do online is they'll learn and practice calculating perimeters and areas. Yeah? They'll learn that online. What the teacher then does in the classroom with them is says, right, we're now going to redesign the school playground. And we're going to use what you've learned and practiced to solve a real problem, if that makes sense. And that's a real problem that needs thinking about. It's higher order thinking. It's not going over and over and over and over again, multiplying two numbers together to get the area of a rectangle. Does this make, make sense? So the teacher is always going to be central to this, certainly in my lifetime. Always going to be central. But the trick is to get the teacher focused more on the higher order things that only a human being can do. And everything else, start looking at it very critically and saying, is there another way of doing this? You know, could that happen in larger groups? You know, and again, we see this, some of the basic stuff you can do in a group of 100, if you've got the technology, if it's just practicing your tables, if it's whatever kind of thing. But the high quality stuff, the mathematical problem solving, you've then got a trade off so it's making some sort, some sort of sense. So I think the challenge for teachers, if I think back to what I did when I was a teacher, a lot of my teaching was instruction of quite low-level stuff which could have been automated. If that had happened somewhere else, then I would genuinely, in my science lessons or my maths lessons, having to be thinking about, what's the more challenging thing that I need to do? If I'm a history teacher, it's not what are the historical facts, it's... How do you construct a historical argument? And how do you reason historically? Yeah? And it's that higher order stuff. So I think teaching is around for a long, long time. It will be done by human beings. But what, what the schools that are embracing technology are doing are thinking very, very hard about what are the things, the ritual and the practice pits, the other sorts of things, the things that they'd learn better from another child than they would from you, the things they'd learn better from another expert than you. And what's the unique thing that you can bring as the shepherd? Walking the children through their learning, keeping track of them, knowing them as individual, and focusing on what, uh, 
in Bloom and various others called that, the higher order thinking skills rather than the lower level repetitive knowledge. Yeah? On the specifics about the, that kind of thing, you then stop caring. It's not a problem if they're learning from YouTube or Khan Academy or whatever kind of thing, because that isn't competing with you. That isn't the bit you do. In fact, you encourage them to do that, yeah, to go to those sources. You're doing the higher order thinking stuff, because you're a human being and the computer isn't.